1971 Robert Altman film called McCabe and Mrs. Miller hit theaters that year. It starred Warren Beatty and Julie Christie. It's based on a 1959 novel entitled McCabe by Edmund Naughton. The director refers to the film as an anti-Western film because it pretty much ignores all the normal things that a Western has in it. The movie employs a lot of dramatic irony, which is really important to the film's success. McCabe is doomed from the beginning of the film, but you just don't know it at that time. But about halfway through viewing it, you realize his fate. He comes across as a big shot in the beginning because rumors are spread that he's killed a man. At this point in the film, he's riding high. But here comes Mrs. Miller, and she takes him down a few pegs. And towards the end, her looks of concern and dire warnings make us fear that something bad is going to happen to him. There's a bit of foreshadowing with another hapless soul, played by Keith Carradine, as he rides into town. It's pretty obvious that he's just another version of McCabe. Another naive soul that won't make it to the end of the film. Pretty much typical with westerns, the film ends with a shootout between McCabe and the guy from the mining company. The way that the film approaches all of this shows how ineffective McCabe is as a hero. First of all, it takes Mrs. Miller to convince him that the company is out to get him. He just doesn't understand that he can't negotiate with them anymore. His character just doesn't have a good understanding of the situation and how to get out of it. At the final shootout, it's definitely not your typical Western ending. The landscape that you see the characters in is very important. It's not the open desert. The film is set in the Northwest. There's snow and pine trees instead of tumbleweeds and cacti. This creates a totally different area for the characters to fight in. Their shootout is not in the middle of a downtown area. It's behind trees, buildings, and snowdrifts. They don't simply face each other and shoot and watch for one of them to fall. There's complete trickery and cowardice at play in this final scene. This is not how a man would normally face his enemies in a western. McCabe is simply a man who wants to remain alive. He's not a bad man or a complete coward. He's just a normal guy that's a bit too fragile for the frontier. Though the film was based on that 1959 novel, the working title of the film was The Presbyterian Church Wager, referring to a bet by a few of the townsfolk on whether McCabe would be killed after refusing to sell his business. The town it takes place in is called Presbyterian Church, and that's because of its most prominent structure, the church. During the production of the film, Warner Brothers was contacted by leaders of the Presbyterian religion, asking them not to use the name of their faith in conjunction with a story about brothels, gambling, and other vices. The title was then changed to John McCabe, and eventually to the final title of McCabe and Mrs. Miller. It's said that Elliot Gould turned down the lead role because of bitter feelings that he had about the movie M.A.S.H. He had starred with Donald Sutherland in Altman's previous film, M.A.S.H., and during that time there was quite a bit of friction on the set between these two. The role of McCabe was offered to Gould, but he rejected it. You see, during the filming of M.A.S.H., Gould and Donald Sutherland had tried to get Altman fired. They went to the producers and did everything they could to make this happen. But I guess Altman wasn't aware of this. So he went ahead and tried to get Elliot Gould for this role. The stars of the movie were a real-life couple who had never worked together before. Hollywood playboy Warren Beatty and British bombshell Julie Christie had an on-and-off relationship going on for several years. Now, one point that I find fairly disturbing to me is that most of these sets were built by American draft dodgers. The film was shot near Vancouver in 1970 when many young Americans were fleeing to Canada to escape the Vietnam draft. Quite a few of these people were hired to help build the town of Presbyterian Church. 
and they even lived in it while doing so. Some of the sets were still being constructed while the movie was being shot. Since the movie was shot in mostly chronological order, and since the the turn-of-the-century town was supposed to be expanding over the course of the story, it just made sense to save time by building some of the sets on camera. Carpenters dressed in period clothes can be seen in the background in some of the scenes doing some of the actual construction work for the set. The director's costume people assembled a vast collection of period clothing of all types, which they hung on racks in one of the buildings in the town. The actors, from the leads on down to the extras, were given free reign to choose their own ensembles within certain guidelines. One pair of pants, maybe a couple of shirts, a coat, etc. Then after choosing these clothes for the entire shoot, they had to take care of them like real Frontiers people would do without the assistance of the wardrobe department. That meant if something got ripped or torn, they had to fix it themselves. The negotiation scenes were inspired by Altman's own experiences that he had with agents and contracts. When McCabe is shown haggling with Shaughnessy people over the sale price of his business, all of this was truly inspired by his own observations of agents negotiating actors' contracts. Among one of the stranger production costs in the film, they had to use $500 to reseed someone's lawn after a donkey got loose and ate it up. The shooting location near Vancouver was sparsely populated, but it did have neighbors. Warner Brothers officials were surprised to see the expenditure listed, though it certainly wasn't the first time that a Hollywood film had incurred expenses because of some reckless jackass. The movie had been shot in a really strange and unusual manner, which was a real risky proposition for Altman. Altman and the cinematographer wanted the final product to appear scratchy, old-timey. That's the look they were going for. They arrived at a method that the studio bosses would never have approved of if they had known about it before it was done. The technique is called flashing, and that means to lightly expose the film negative before you shoot it. That makes it hard to set the exposure, and it really increases the chances of the whole batch being botched up. The studio wasn't happy with the look that was achieved, but there was nothing that could be done about it after the fact. And this is one of the reasons that Altman did it that way so the studio couldn't change his work. I feel like it gives it a great look, exactly what he was trying to achieve. Like most of Altman's films, this movie has a naturalistic overlapping of dialogue. Instead of one person saying a line, and then another person saying another line, the characters talk like they do in real life, often interrupting each other, stammering, speaking over one another, and trailing off. He wanted the sound to be almost like real life. Sometimes you don't understand what people are saying. A Shelley Duvall appears in the film playing one of the hookers that's employed by McCabe. Through the years, she had a long-lasting relationship with the director, Robert Altman. He was initially really impressed with her upbeat presence on the screen. Despite her hesitancy towards becoming an actress, she continued to work with Altman, and she became a really big name in Hollywood, starring in her most prominent role in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. But in November of 2016, the popular actress agreed to be interviewed by Dr. Phil on his daytime talk show. The backlash from all this was monumental in a couple of ways. Number one, everybody thought that Dr. Phil was exploiting this actress. And I have to admit, the interview is terribly upsetting to see this lovely lady seeming so vulnerable at this time in her life. Dr. Phil repeatedly tries to offer her inpatient treatment, which she constantly declines. This warm and friendly actress is definitely troubled. Her thought processes are not right. She makes quite a few bizarre statements during this interview. She's completely retired from acting nowadays and lives in Texas. 
Take a look at this fantastic Robert Altman film. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy it. It's not what you normally see in a Western. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.